Greetings and welcome back to the viewing of DVD number six in our series, Decision Time. Brothers and sisters, I cannot overemphasize the need of us seriously studying the Word of God on this very important subject. Before we have prayer, I want to go to the Word of God. Let us go to Genesis, the third chapter. Genesis, the third chapter. And we want to start with verses 1. Genesis 3, verses 1. Saints, this is very important. Genesis 3, 1, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And you know, brothers and sisters, when we study the word of God, we should study it line upon line, precept upon precept, here a low and there a low. And the Bible says we should live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So we want to look at this word for word. Now the serpent was more subtle. That word subtle means more artful, more cunning, and more crafty. More artful, more cunning, and more crafty. And the Bible goes on to say, Yea, have God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Brothers and sisters, it was never God's plan that we should know good and evil. Only the good. Now we must remember this as we get into our study today, looking at the glorious land. God never intended for us to know evil, only the good. Let's go over to 2 Corinthians. Let's look at chapter 11, and let's look at verses 3, I believe. We want to tie this, this verse right in with what we just read in Genesis, and then we will have prayer and ask God's blessings upon us as we get into today's study. 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. Now, we have found out that subtlety means more artful, more cunning, and more crafty. Verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The Bible says here that Lucifer, that Satan, the serpent, beguiled Eve through his subtlety. That word beguile means to charm, to cheat, and to lead by deception. So by his subtlety, he was able to charm Eve, he was able to cheat Eve, and to lead her by deception. Now, brothers and sisters, please remember this as we continue in our study today. Let us have prayer at this time, and I plead with you that you will also have prayer as we seek the Lord for understanding. Seek the Lord to simply obey his word. Father in heaven, in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we come humbly before thy righteous and holy throne. We ask thy blessing, Lord, upon the information that we're about to share. We ask you to give us clarity of thought, clarity of mind. And Lord, we ask that thou will bless those that are listening and viewing this information. Lord, help them to disciple it and put it in, a, in its proper perspective that they may be able to make a decision for thee and not for Satan. Oh, God, please help us. Please, Lord, we're in a crisis. Please, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, saints, we are going to share some very serious information during the viewing of this DVD. Some of these things I've already shared in another series called the Elijah series. So I'm, I won't go back and 
cover everything that I've already uh, covered in this Elijah series, but I want to touch the high points, the points that would be necessary for you to grasp what we're talking about. I want to go to our screen. I want to just refresh your memory from what we've already covered thus far. So I want to go to the screen at this point in time and just make sure you and I are on the, on the same page. I want to tell you some things. This is decision time. It is a time where you and I collectively will have to decide whether we're going to do what God says do or what we're going to do what man says do. And Peter says in, in, in Acts 5, 29, it is better to obey God than to obey man. Going back a little bit, saints, just for just a little bit, just maybe a, a slide or two, we have discovered that the king of the south of Daniel 1140, 1798, that made an attack upon the king of the north, and the king of the north in 1798 was the papacy. We have discovered that the king of the south made an attack upon the king of the north. And again, I want to emphasize the fact that the Bible calls the power that attacked the papacy in 1798 a king. I want to emphasize that. That the Bible calls it a king. We have discovered that that king of the south of Daniel 1140 is also the sixth head of Revelation, the 17th chapter. We have discovered that it is also the beast from the bottomless pit of Revelation, the 11th chapter, and we have discovered that it is the new manifestation of satanic power that, was, that came in on, into, on the scene to make open a vowed war upon the word of God during the French Revolution. So I want us to make sure we put all that together because we are going to find out where the glorious land is and what Satan is doing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, so the prophet herself calls this king of the south, she says it was atheism. We know that this atheism attacked the word of God in France, and the Bible accurately predicted that their dead bodies shall lie in the street of France, or in the street which is spiritually called Egypt and Sodom for three and a half years, three and a half days, which computes out to three and a half years, and brothers and sisters, history shows it that, that it took place just like God said it was going to take place. And so the prophet labels it as atheism. So the king of the south, she says, is atheism. This atheism came out of the French Revolution and went to the East as communism. It came to the West as secular humanism. George McCreary Price, in his book, Time of the End, he says, on this basis, the Americanization of religion throughout the Occidental world, that word Occidental is an old word, simply means the West, throughout the Occidental world is only a variant form of the communism of China and Russia. In the light of heavenly truth, these two systems are essentially twins. And that's exactly correct. Communism and secular humanism in the eyesight of God are essentially twins. Both of them is anti-Genesis. They are anti-God. No belief in God whatsoever. Let's continue. Now we know that the Britannica says that the Illuminati was a short-lived organization and their goal was to introduce or replace Christianity with a religion of reason. Now we know that it was not a short-lived movement. But their goal was to replace Christianity with a religion of reason. And so, brothers and sisters, we can see that the goals and the principles of the Illuminati was active in the French Revolution. That ideology, that power that made an attack upon the word of God during the French Revolution was simply an instrument of the Illuminati. And, then, and the word Illuminati itself tells us, speaks volume to us because Illuminati, enlightened ones, we know that the 1600s brought into, in, into Revelation a period called the Enlightenment of the Age of Reason. And so, brothers and sisters, back in Genesis, when the, when, 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 when the serpent told Eve, your eyes shall be open, he's simply saying your eyes shall be enlightened. So we can see, saints, that this is nothing but an instrument of Satan, the Illuminati. And so, saints, 
when we look at this, this atheism is simply, looking at the screen now, an open avowed war, uh, an agency by Satan to make an open avowed war upon the word of God, and it is nothing but illuminism. This atheism is illuminism, and illuminism have a broader scope. Because when we say atheism, we simply narrow it in. When we, we call, speak of someone being an atheist, we speak of someone that's openly just atheist. But illuminism is a more subtle uh, belief of the same thing. Remember, Satan was more subtle. I mean, he's more artful. He's more cunning, and he's more crafty. And he, he, he has the ability to charm you, to cheat you, and to lead you by deception. And so, brothers and sisters, I want to make sure that we start off on here on solid ground. We start on the same page that this, this, uh, this, 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 this king of the south is the sixth head of Revelation 17 chapter. It is the beast from the bottomless pit of Revelation 11 chapter. It is the new manifestation of satanic power to make open of our war upon the word of God. It came out of the French Revolution. It went to the east as communism. It went to the west as secular humanism. Let's continue, saints. We are to see in history the fulfillment of prophecy. I want, to, I want to talk on that for a moment. We are to see in history the fulfillment of prophecy. God himself lays down this principle in Isaiah 42. And we want to go back to for, for one moment. Isaiah 42.9. Lord, please be with us as we study your word. Isaiah Chapter 42, and I pray and plead with you, get your Bibles, and please get a King James Bible. As we, as we talked last time, if you have an NIV, don't use it. Do not use it. Isaiah 42.9, the Bible says, Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Here God is simply saying, check me out. The former things, which the things in the past, have come to pass, just as I said they were going to come to pass. And new things do I declare before they spring forth, I'll tell you. Them. What are the new things? The new things, brothers and sisters, are prophecy. And so what God is saying, check me out and see, did those things in the past take place just as I said they were? If those things took place, then you can have faith to believe that the things that are yet to take place are going to take place. So Jesus, the Bible says, that, behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things do I declare before they spring forth, I tell you. The Bible continues to tell us in 2 Peter, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto we do well that we take heed as unto a light that shines into a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in our own heart. Knowing this and no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation for prophecies came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God. We can put our faith in it. Let's continue, saints. So we are to see in history the fulfillment of prophecy. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to see in history now the fulfillment of prophecy. Now, we all remember this chart here, this map. We all remember this from some time back. Back in when we was talking about the king of the north and the king of the south, the geographical king of the north and the geographical king of the south. We look at this map, we look up at the top, and we see the Seleucids of Syria, and this was deemed the king of the north. We look down at the bottom, down in Egypt, the Ptolemies, the Ptolemies, and we get the king of the south. And in between these two kings, in between the these two kings, the geographical territory between these two kings was a place called Jerusalem, and the Bible calls this little bit of real estate the glorious land. That's the glorious land. Now, saints, I don't want to lead you. I don't want to do as Satan to lead you and to charm you and to cheat you. I want you to see this for yourself. So I want you to look at this. Pause the, 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 the DVD if you need to. I want you to see this for yourself. Here we have the geographical king of the north, the Seleucids, up in Syria. We have the, the king of the south down in Egypt, the Ptolemies. And in between, we have the glorious land, which is Jerusalem. This was the geographical location. Now, we know, as, as we went through Daniel 11, 
in uh, DVD number two, we discovered, brothers and sisters, that the territory of the kingdom of the north changed hands from Syria to pagan Rome to paper Rome. It ended up in the hands of paper Rome in Daniel 11.31. And from Daniel 11.31 down to Daniel 11.39, we have the activity of the papers of the kingdom of the north. In Daniel 11.40, all of a sudden, this king of the south attacks the king of the north. Now, we know historically from our study that Egypt, the geographical king of the south, ceased to exist as a power way back in 31 B.C. when Augustus Caesar, uh, Octavia, defeated Mark Anthony and Cleopatra at the Battle of Actium. So in 31 B.C., there is no more geographical king of the south. And so when our goal was to find out who was this entity that attacked the king of the north in 1798. And we have now discovered who that king was. But another point. Back then, when the king of the north and the king of the south was fighting back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, Jerusalem, history says, was just a byword. They had lost their distinctiveness. They were, had been so disobedient that they were just a byword in, among the nations of that time. And so they found themselves yielding to whatever power ruled the world at that time. When the king of the north was the ruling power, then the Jews, Jerusalem, found themselves paying tribute to the king of the north. When the king of the south mustered up enough power to go back and attack the king of the north, then the Jews found themselves having to pay tribute to the king of the south. And so this back and forth went, went on for years because, they had, because of the fact, brothers and sisters, that they were spiritually weak, they were also military weak, and God would not come to their rescue. Are you with me, saints? Now, when we get down to, down to 1140, we have a spiritual king of the north, which is a papacy, and we have a spiritual entity, the king of the south, that attacks the king of the north. Are you with me, saints? So we have now moved from a geographical location to a spiritual entity. Are you with me, saints? Now, we have discovered, let's go to Daniel 11.40 right quick. Daniel 11.40, let's go there, saints. Daniel 11.40. We are studying the word of God. Let's look at Daniel 11.40. Get your Bibles. Don't, don't trust me to read it to you correctly. Get your Bible. And the Bible says in Daniel 11.40, And at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over here we see saints that the king of the south attacks the king of the north and a minister the deadly wound in 1798 now we know historically that the papacy did not have any power to make a counterattack upon the king of the south anywhere around 1798. As a matter of fact, brothers and sisters, we know historically that once the papacy received a deadly wound in 1798, it wanted to go down, down, down. It went into total obscurity. As a matter of fact, brothers and sisters, in 18, let me see, 1870, we know that the popes locked themselves into the Vatican and said they would not come out until... Uh, the Italian government restored to them their papal states, their sovereignty. And we know again historically that in 1929, Mussolini signed the Carcadoc and gave back to the, to the Vatican their, 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 their papal states. But 1929 did not heal the deadly wound because, brothers and sisters, it was a separation of church and state that caused the deadly wound. It can only be a uniting of church and state that will heal the deadly wound. And great, I mean, in Testimonies, Volume 5, page 712, says when America passes a national Sunday law, it will be nothing more than healing this deadly wound. Our healing are given back to this power is tyranny with which it before possessed. And so, brothers and sisters, it is a fact that the deadly wound will not be healed until there is again a union of church and state. But so we see that there was no power for the papacy to make a counterattack anywhere after 1798. And we've already gone through 1989 now. And we know that the papacy cannot do anything unless a civil power stands on his side. And so we've already shown in the, in the previous DVD that in 1989 that the papacy did indeed make a counterattack. And who stood by his side? None other than in the United States. 
and communism was brought down. Now, again, we want to emphasize that the sixth head is not gone, but the attack has started on this anti-God movement. We want to understand that. Even right now as we're speaking, saints, this, this sixth head is mustering his arms, and we, we get the gay rights here, and all, all kinds of things of this nature is, is taking place. But brothers and sisters, I want to promise you one thing on the authority of the word of God. Soon, and very soon, all of this is going to come to an end. When we have this national center of our brothers and sisters, everybody's going to be forced into a system of false morality. You just watch. All right, let's continue. So we see in, in Daniel 11:40 that the king of the north made a counterattack in 1989. We already we've already explained that from the previous DVD. Now let's continue. Now today. The thought pro let, let's, let's wait, let's look at let's wait one, one moment. We know that Jerusalem, the geographical king of the south, lost that distinctive title in 34 AD, and we're coming back to this 34 AD a little late in this, in this DVD. They lost that distinctive title in 34 AD because they rejected the Son of God. We know that they had 70 uh, weeks of 490 years. And in 34 AD at the Stone of Stevenson, probation closed on the Jewish nation. We, like I said, we're going to talk about that a little bit more, uh, a little later on here. But in 34 AD, Jerusalem, geographical Jerusalem, is no longer the glorious land. Are you with me, saints? Are you with me? Now, there is speculation. There is talk. There are books and tapes and what have you. And I say this very tactfully. I don't say this with any rudeness or any malice or anything whatsoever. But we simply must not be led astray by Satan. And as we go, you're going to see how critical this is that we rightly identify who the, what a glorious land is today. There's speculation that the, that the United States today is the, 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 the glorious land. We see that, in, in, that, in, that the papacy, the Catholic Church, is the king of the north. We see that Illuminism today is the king of the south. Are you with me, saints? The papacy is a spiritual entity. Illuminism is a spiritual entity, an ideology. Now, how can the United States be the glorious land today? How does the United States fit anti-typically between the, the Catholic Church and Illuminism? It doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit, brothers and sisters. The more logical explanation, and we're going to say logical, and then we're going to prove that it is a fact, would be that this spirit, that this glorious land today would have to also be a spiritual entity. Now, brothers and sisters, we know that the Jews were God's chosen people. Well, who is God's chosen people today? We know. We call ourselves spiritual Israel, don't we? Let's look at the screen, saints. The church is the glorious land today, brothers and sisters, and not just any church, it is a particular church. It is the Seventh-day Adventist church with, with ramifications throughout the whole entire world. This is where the glorious land is today, saints. Let's continue. I'm not the only one that believes that this is true. Here's a book. I mean, just, I have a book on the screen. I'm just going to show it. Here is a book by a man by the name of Peter C. Johns. Peter C. Johns, and the title of the book is The Sanctuary Restored. And it's a very good book. I wish you could get the book, but the book is out of print. You might can go on the web and put in, go to some of the uh, used book places, and you can find it. Matter of fact, we just found one for a friend of mine. So, um, but it's, it's, I wish you could get this book. It is an excellent book. But I want to show you now what he says about this book, which, by the way, was uh, written back in 1968, I believe, 68 or 69, copyright. I want, to, I want you to see what he says now about the glorious land. Now I'm going to take, this is page 98, I'm going to take that page and blow it up for you a little bit so you can really see it. Daniel, describing the combined apostasy at the end of time, saw that the man of sin, did you get that? The king of the north, would enter also into the glorious land, the church. Do you see that, saints? Let me read it again. Pause your, your TV. Make sure you, you get this. 
Daniel describing the combined apostasy at the end of time saw that the man of sin, the king of the north, who is the king of the north? The papacy. Would enter also into the glorious land, the church, and that tens of thousands shall fall. Daniel 11, 41, Revised Standard Version. The revelator declared that he would do great wonders so that he make a fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do. These precious leaves no doubt as to a counterfeit lot of rain. Now we want to continue saying this. Another book. Now I'm not, I'm not basing my study on what other people said. I'm basing it on what I've studied and I'm just collaborating what others have already studied themselves. Now that book was back in 1967. Here's another book. It's called by David A. Miller. It's called Prophetic Secrets. Now this is a more recent book. I believe the copyright on this book is around 2003, I believe. 2000, no, 1998, I'm sorry, 1998. It's called Prophetic Secrets. Now let's see what does Mr. Miller has to say. Now, I don't know this gentleman. I'm just simply reading, read his book. I read some of his book anyway. This is what he says. Let me blow it up for you so that you can see it. We are studying the word of God. We are looking, we're trying to determine where is the glorious land. Let's look at this thing. The glorious land is God's people today. The glorious land is what? The glorious land is God's people today who have been carrying the banner of truth. It is spiritual Israel, saints, the glorious land is spiritual Israel, not the land of Israel in the Middle East. This means that the papacy would have a strong influence on the people of God. Now, you need to let that sink in, saints. Let me read it again. This means that the papacy would have a strong influence on the people of God. Now, saints, we, as we continue to go here, we're going to show you that this is exactly what has happened. I'm going to go a step further than Mr. Miller. What is the position now being taken within most Protestant churches toward the Catholic Church? Most churches are taking reconciliation, talking reconciliation, and a return to the same position as before the Protestant Reformation. Ecumenicalism is the present day trend. Yes, all of the Protestant churches are coming together. Recently, John Hagee had to make a public apology. No, he made a public recantation of the things that he had said about the Catholic Church. He had to go to New York and publicly recant what he had said about the Catholic Church. And he found the information from the Bible, but he recanted. Now, it's all right for John Haggai to recant. But when a seven-day Adventist began to recant, brothers and sisters, there's something vastly wrong. Are you hearing me? Look what else it says, saints. He shall also enter the glorious land. Means some of God's people will fall to the awe-inspiring power and influence of the papacy. Did you hear that, saints? Although the papacy will enter the church of God, it will not overcome all within. Because Ellen G. White says there will be a few. And I want to emphasize, she said there will be a few that will stand for the truth. But she says, I was shown the startling fact that but a small portion of those who have professed faith in the third angel's message were going to be sanctified by it. Only a small portion. That's Testimonies, Volume 1, page 608. In, in Great Controversy, page 608, she says, as the storm approaches, a large class gave up and kept Sunday. In another place, uh, spiritual gifts, not spiritual gifts, Christian service, 157, 155, 157. Those who have assumed the ornaments of the sanctuary but have not been sanctified by it, brothers and sisters, are going to give up. In another place, she says, the church appeared as about to fall. She says it did not. It remained while the sentence in Zion was shaking up. But, and we often stick our chest out. Oh, yes, the church will appear as about to fall, but it will not. But brothers and sisters, when you read the whole statement, she's saying as a result of the passing of the national son in law she saw no Adventists left. She thought the whole church had fell. 
And then she saw a few here and there get up and, and, and get themselves together. As we continue, saints, you're going to see because you know why, saints? Because this new manifestation of satanic power that, was, that came out of the French Revolution to make open a vowed war upon the word of God has infiltrated the Seventh-day Adventist church. And the result is the apparent giving up of our doctrines. And we are ready to do whatever, whoever says. Let me continue reading this thing, saints. This is decision time, brothers and sisters. This is no time for us to play. Although the papacy will enter the church of God, it will not overcome all within. There will be a victorious faithful that remain. There will also be others. Some will escape. Now, I'll be honest with you, saints. Mr. Miller is making it very mild, but I'm going to give you the cutting truths from the word of God and from the spirit of prophecy. It's decision time. You need to understand it. It is decision time. You need to understand this for yourself. Not because I said it, but because the word of God and the spirit of prophecy says it. History says it. Continuing on now. So where is the glorious land today? Where, brothers and sisters, is the glorious land today? It is God's church. Now let me read and quote to you from Testimonies, Volume 4, page 210 to 211. It is page 210 to 211. And we want to see now what the prophet has to say. And I want to start with how she puts this together. She makes a, a, a comparison. She says, if the heart pumps good blood, she says, every organ in the body will benefit from the good blood. But she says, if the heart pumps bad blood, every organ in the body will suffer from the bad blood. Then she goes on to say that our headquarters is the head or the heart of the work. Let me see. Let's, let's see what she says now. Let's, let's see what, how does she put it together. And by the way, if we don't believe in this woman, Ellen G. White, as a prophet of God, then you are not a seven-day Adventist. You might be going to a seven-day Adventist church, you might be going through the motions, but you really are a foolish virgin. Are you hearing me, saints? It's decision time. Do you believe, do you believe the Bible when the Bible says in Re Revelation 12, 17, he went to make war with the remnant of the sea which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ? But brothers and sisters, either she is a prophet or she's not. And Testimonies, volume 5, page 671, she says, God, there's no halfway work in the mountain. This work is of God or is it of the devil. My work bears the stamp of God or the stamp of the enemy. And I'll tell you again, saints, I have a hard time believing that the devil wrote great controversy. Our desire of ages, our steps to Christ. This work is of God or is, 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 is of the devil. This, if, you, if you're sitting in a church where the pastor calls this one of his favorite writers, then you better get out of there. Because she is not one of our favorite writers, brothers and sisters. She is a prophet. Why are we ashamed of her? Why are we making every attempt we can to get around Ellen G. White? When Selected Messages Book 1, page 48 says, I was shown that the last deception of Satan would be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. She says, there will be a hatred killing against my writings, which is satanic. We're seeing this right now, brothers and sisters. Right now, we're seeing this. Don't we understand that we are living in the very end of time, that this is indeed the omega of apostasy that we're in, saints? It's decision time, saints. We have, we have to make a decision on this woman. Is this woman representing God or is she representing the devil? And I'm going to tell you, saints, I'm going to stand flat-footed here and tell you that if you don't believe in Ellen G. White as a prophet, then you have set yourself up for all the delusions of this end time. She says, one thing is certain. Those seven-day Adventists who give up their faith in the warrants and reproofs in the testimony of God's Spirit will take their stand under Satan's banner. This is serious. It's decision time. I see what the prophet says. She says, Satan's chief work is at the headquarters of our faith. He spares no pains to corrupt men in responsible positions. The headquarters of our church affects the whole body of believers. She goes on to say, if the heart of the work becomes corrupt, the whole church in its various branches and interests scattered abroad over the face of the earth, 
suffers in consequence. Did you get that, saints? If the hard work becomes corrupt, if headquarters become corrupt, then the whole church is going to suffer. What? That means the general conference, if it becomes corrupt, then the division leaders, the union leaders, the conference leaders, the pastors, the departmental heads, the church board, and the members all become corrupt because general conference is corrupt. Look what she says. It is Satan's plan to weaken the faith of God's people in the testimonies. That's Satan's plan. Next follows skepticism in regard to the vital points of our faith, the pillars of our position. Do you understand what the pillars of our position is, saints? Do you understand what foundation God gave us in 1844 and onward? Remember, we talked about this briefly, about that in the first DVD. Then what happens next? Then doubt as to the Holy Scriptures. And then the downward march to perdition. In other words, saints, it's laid out. When you give up your belief in the testimony, you are now prepared to give up your belief in the pillars of our position. We see it happening all over this denomination. Then you're ready to give up your belief in the Bible itself, and we see it happening. We've already talked about it some. We show you what Ella Pearson had to say when he was retiring in, 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 in uh, 1978. And that's just a little snippet, just a little small snippet. But number four says, and then the downward march to perdition. When the testimonies which was once believed are doubted and given up, Satan knows the deceived ones will not stop at this, and he redoubles his efforts until he launches them into open rebellion, which becomes incurable and ends in destruction. Are we on the same page, brothers and sisters? Do we understand what we're reading, what we're seeing? All right, let's go now back to the Bible. Let's go to Daniel 11, 41. As a matter of fact, let's start at Daniel 11, 40 and 41. Daniel 11, 40 and 41. Now, let's read it. The Bible says now, And at the time of the end, 1798, shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, 1989. Now, I want you to get the point here. In the geographic, when the geographic king of the north and king of the south was fighting back and forth, once the king of the north would defeat the king of the south, or the king of the south would defeat the king of the north, the next thing he would do is enter the glorious land and demand that the Jews pay them tribute money. So, here we see in Daniel 11, 40 and 41, we see the king of the south attacks the king of the north. Then the king of the north makes a counterattack and attacks the king of the south in 1989. And it goes on to say, shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Now, let's look at verse 41. He shall enter also into the glorious land. Now, saints, we have established pretty much here that the glorious land is the church. And it's the Seventh-day Adventist church. And so what we're seeing here is that the papacy the Catholic Church, the king of the north, would enter the glorious land. Now, if we look at it sequentially, he makes the counterattack in 1989. So that means sometime after 1989 that the papacy, the Catholic Church, the king of the north, would enter into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Well, if that's a fact, how did he enter? What, what's going on here? Let's continue reading. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Adam. This is very interesting, saints. Let's go to our screen now. Let's put this in chart form. Here's our glorious land. The Bible says... The kings of the earth and all the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy should have entered into the gates of Jerusalem. This is from Lamentations 4.12. And what this is saying, that the kings of the earth would not have believed that Nebuchadnezzar would have entered the glorious land and did what he did. They would have never thought that would happen. And today, brothers and sisters, we would never think that the king of the north, which is now Bible, uh, the spiritual Bible, which is the papacy, 
when in a God's church, when in fact God has called us to expose the man of sin? Let's look. Here we have what I call the National Sunday Law Charter. On our left, we have 1844. The next is the National Sunday Law, NSL. That stands for NSL, stands for National Sunday Law. The next is COP, which stands for the close of probation. And the next is the SC, which stands for the second coming. We have those four red posters across there. We have the judgment of the dead uh, between 1844 and the National Sunday Law. We have, this is, this is the preparation time. Down below that, we have the church militant. Moving to our right, we have the judgment of the living and the church triumphant. And moving on to our right, we have church victorious, and we have a little, the seven last plagues, and the, our bread and water will be sure. Most of us think our bread and water will be sure from the National Center of Law Far, but that's not true. Bread and water is only going to be sure after the close of probation. We had to prepare for the little time of trouble, which is the period between the NSL, the National Center of Law, and the close of probation. But we're not being told this. You have to prepare. That's the reason most are going to give up right here between the NSL and the, and the COP. But my purpose now is for us to look at this chart and put what we have just read from Daniel 11.40 to Daniel 11.41 on this chart. So if Daniel 11.40 opens in 1798, that means we would need to start just back of 1844 on this chart, back to 1798, which would have been some 46 years before. So we have Daniel 11.40. Here's our yellow line going across there. We have Daniel 11.40, just back of 1844. And then this yellow line runs all the way across the National Center Law, all the way down to the close of probation, and we have Daniel 12.1. So now let's go to our Bibles and let's read Daniel 12.1. Daniel 12.1 says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. So Daniel 12, 1 takes us down to the close of probation when Jesus stands up in the most holy place and delivers the saints. In other words, brothers and sisters, they are sealed now eternally. That's when the, the Bible says, he that is just, let him be just still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. In reality, saints, Daniel 12, 1 should be a part of the, 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 the story of Daniel 11, 40 to Daniel 11, 45. Because remember, originally, the Bibles were not chaptertized, uh, verses, uh, even, even, it wasn't even, didn't even have punctuation marks. They, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it being in chapters. It's easy to find, nothing wrong with being in verses. But what I'm just saying is the thought does not end with verse 45. It ends with verse 1, 12, 1. So, so 12, 1 should be actually 11, 46, if you understand what I'm saying here. So this takes us down to the time in which Michael stands up in God's people to deliver. So on our chart here on the screen, we have Dan, starting at Daniel 11, 40, and takes us all the way over to Daniel 12, 1 to the close our probation. Now, continuing, Daniel 1140 opens in 1798 and it closes in 1989. And so once Daniel 1140 closes, then we pick up with Daniel 1141. Now, what I'm saying is that the papacy, the Catholic Church, the King of the North would enter the glorious land, God's church, sometime after 1989. Let's continue. So I have put Daniel 1141 just after 1989. Now I'm going to put a date just above Daniel 1141. In other words, I'm putting a date there as a suggestion or maybe a fact that at this date, the king of the north entered the glorious land. I'm going to let you decide. I put 1995 there. What I'm seeing here is that in 1995, that the king of the north entered the glorious land. Now, I want to hasten to add that I don't mean that it was an abrupt thing. I'm going to show you that it was a time sequence thing, that this thing has been going on for a time. 
Ellen G. White says, those who are yielding step by step to worldly demands will find it an easy thing to yield to the powers that be. I want you to know that Satan unleashed a new manifestation of satanic power to make open of our war upon the word of God back coming out of the French Revolution. And God brought us into existence and gave us instruction, just like he gave Eve, as how to avoid the deception, the subtlety of Satan. And we fail. And you know what, saints? I'm not here accusing anyone. We simply was outsmarted because we just simply didn't obey. If Eve had obeyed, it would have never happened. We simply did not obey. Good men just simply did not obey. That's what we, that's what we are. All right? So 1995, we have Daniel 11.41. And Daniel 11.42 takes us right to the sun to roll. And if we were, we were, maybe later on we'll come back and go through these verses in detail. I, that's not our purpose here today. Can't, don't have the time. Let's continue. And then 3, 4, and 5 takes us after the son of law. If you read those verses, you'll see that 42 takes us to the, the national son of law. 43, no man will be able to buy, said he should have control over the gold and the silver. Revelation 12, I mean 13 says, there'll come a time when no man will be able to buy and sell. And that's when he will have control over the gold and the silver, et cetera, et cetera. That's, but we don't have time to get into those verses right now. So this chart takes us, brothers and sisters, from 1798 all the way, all the way down to the close of probation. It takes us past the National Center Law, the ceiling, the, the, the found shaking, the ceiling, because at the Center Law, brothers and sisters, you, you, you should already have a little book to close the probation for Seven Day Adventists. You should understand that at the National Center Law, brothers and sisters, the found separation takes place, and the wheat and tares are separated saints. And the wheat receive the, mark, the seal of God, and the tares receive the mark of the beast based on their decision. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Now we're going to move in order for us to understand how we arrived at 1995. You and I are now going to have to go back in time, and we're going to have to start with the ministry of Jesus and walk far. All right, brothers and sisters, let's continue in our quest for knowledge from the Word of God. You know, the Bible says that it is the Holy Spirit that will lead us into all truth. And so we sincerely need the blessings and guidance of the Holy Spirit as we continue to dig into his Word. Now, we have put some things in place here. We have discovered historically that in 1798 that the king of the south attacks the king of the north, and that in 1989 that the king of the north makes a counterattack, and now we are put on the board that the king of the north, the papacy, the Catholic Church, enters the glorious land somewhere around 1995. Now, we need to go back, and we need to start walking forward to put some things in place so that you will understand it, so that you will be able to make a decision based on your own study and knowledge and what have you, from your own searching rather than just something that I said. I don't want you to go say, Brother Mason said anything. I want you to be able to say, the word of God, the spirit of prophecy, and history bears this out. All right? So let's now, let's go to Luke, the fourth chapter. And we're looking at the ministry of Jesus. The ministry of Jesus. The Bible says in, in Luke, the fourth chapter, verses 16, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for the reading. Now, that's, so, that's a story here, a really, really deep story that we can't get into all of it. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Verse 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Now, saints, First of all, we should recognize, where is Jesus? Is he 
in among the Samaritans? Is he among the Gentiles? Or is he among the lost sheep of the house of Israel? And the obvious answer is he's among his people. He's among the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He's among the Jews. And so look what he's coming to do. Again, he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's the poor. It's in the church. He has sent me to heal the broken heart. Now you said, Brother Mason, that's a supposition. Well, let's see if it's the supposition. He has sent me to heal the broken heart. To preach deliverance to the captives. Ellen G. White tells us in the Desire of Ages, page 36, 37, somewhere along in there. She says, when Jesus came on the scene, she says, the Jews, the people whom God had chosen to be his representatives, had become the representatives of Satan. That they were his captives. That he had taken control of them. She goes on to say that he had taken control of their organs and were using them in the vilest of lust. So to preach deliverance to the captives, God, Jesus here, was talking to his own people, to the Jews. And recovering of sight to the blind. You need to zero in on that word recovering. The recovering of sight to the blind. That word recovering means that at one time they could, have, they could see, but they have been made blind. And Jesus has now come to give them recovering of their sight. So they are blind, but at one time they could see. And we need to find out what, what caused them to go blind in the first place. Oh, brothers and sisters, it's decision time. Recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of them all were, that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, thanks that's so much here because first of all, here Jesus is reading from the word of God and he's actually fulfilling prophecy because as he's reading it, he's saying this prophecy is now being fulfilled in your very eyes. It's now being taking place right now. But I don't have time to get into all those details. But the, uh, here's the point. He says, this day is this fulfilled in your ears. Go on to our screen now. 27 AD, Jesus is baptized. He goes into the wilderness and he fasts for 40 days, we know, and he comes back. And we just read what happens when he comes back. The prophet says the burden of Christ's preaching was the time is fulfilled. Lord be with us. This is serious. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Thus, the gospel message as given by the Savior himself was based on the prophecies. The gospel message that's given by Jesus himself was based on the prophecies. That's deep. The time which he declared to be fulfilled was the period made known by the angel Gabriel to Daniel. Seventy weeks, said the angel, are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sin and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So the time in which Jesus is sin, the time is fulfilled, was a time that Gabriel had told Daniel about way back in Daniel 9, 24. The time is fulfilled. So Gabriel was told Daniel and predicted when the Messiah would come. He would come in 27 AD. He would start his ministry. Now let's continue, brothers and sisters. And he gave, at that time, he says, 70 weeks are allocated to your people. So 70 weeks would take us from, from, from 457 all the way down to 34 AD. Jesus started his ministry the, in the last seven years of the Jewish probation. And we see what they had to do. Now, we're going to take this and look at it in, in detail. Seven weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Here's what they had to do within seven weeks of 490 years. This is what they had to do, saints. I want you to look at this, brothers and sisters. First of all, they had to finish the transgression. 
They had to make an end of sin. They had to make reconciliation for iniquity. They had to bring in everlasting righteousness. They had to seal up the vision and prophecy. And they had to anoint the most holy. Now, brothers and sisters, their probation ended in 34 AD. Now, we want to see how, does this, how is this applicable to you and I today. There's the 34 AD. Now, let's look at it. What the Jews had to do by 34 AD, Seventh-day Adventists have to do by the National Son of Law. In other words, saints, in order for you and I to receive the seal of God, and the prophet says not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot of stain upon them. It is left of us to remedy the defects in our characters, to cleanse the soul temple from every defilement, and then the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost. In other words, saints, you and I must Finish the transgression by the passing of the national son of law. We must make an end of sins by the, by the passing of the national son of law. We must make reconciliation for iniquity by the passing of the national son of law. We must bring in everlasting righteousness, saints, by the passing of the national son of law. We must seal the division of prophecy. We must anoint the most holy by the passing of the national son of law. And saints, you and I cannot do this in our own strength. We can only do this by the righteousness of Christ. Perfection, brothers and sisters. It's not our perfection, it's Christ's perfection. And so we need to, to develop, we must have a vital connection with Christ by the passion of a national son of law, or we will give up and keep sending. Christ, our righteousness. That's another story in itself. But saints, I just, this is important, this is very important. So what the Jews had to do by 34 AD, you and I must accomplish by the national son of law. Now you should have a little book. The close of probation for seven day events. And it should not be any question now in your mind about this fact. Let us continue. So 34 AD and the National Son of Law then become parallel events. Now remember Christ started his ministry in 27 AD. All right, let's continue. Parallels. Then said the angel, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, which is seven years. For seven years, after the Savior ended on his ministry, the gospel was to be preached especially to the Jews. Now, saints, I want us to make sure that we understand what we're reading here. For seven years after he ended on his ministry, the gospel was to be preached especially to the Jews. Because when Jesus started his ministry, there was only seven years left on their probation. Now, remember, we are heading toward 1995, but we have to lay this foundation. The gospel was to be preached especially to the Jews for three and a half years by Christ himself and afterward by the apostles. Now get the point, saints. For three and a half years, Christ was going to present this information. And then the next three and a half years would be done by his disciples, or by his apostles. In the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. In the spring of A.D. 31, Christ, the true sacrifice, was offered on Calvary. Then the veil of the temple was rent in twain, showing that the sacredness and significance of the sacrificial service had departed. The time had come for the earthly sacrifice and oblation to cease. And again, saints, it's right with what Gabriel told Daniel over in, in Daniel 9, chapter 24 through 27. A key point, look at the top of your screen. You see 27 A.D., you see 31 A.D., and you see 34 A.D. Between 27 and 31 A.D., you see three and a half years. Between 31 A.D. And, and 34 A.D., you see three and a half years. You see that Christ was the carrier on his ministry by from himself, rather, for three and a half years, and then the next three and a half years would be by his apostles. Because once Christ died on the cross, we know that after he was resurrected, he stayed on the earth for 40 days, after, and then he went back to heaven, and the apostles carried on the, the ministry for the next three and a half years after receiving the early reign on the day of Pentecost, after they had come in one accord there in the upper room. Are you with me, saints? There's so much there. Let's continue. So between 27 and, and 31 A.D. is the time that Jesus himself carried on his ministry. Now remember, the ministry was to last for seven years. Three and a half years by Jesus and three and a half years by the apostles. So, 
Let's see what the prophet has to say. If, if the leaders in Israel had received Christ, he would have honored them as his messengers. Thanks there's so much here because we, we could go to the scripture and show you all the things that Jesus did to get the, the, the chief priests and the leaders of his time to accept the message, and they would not. But we don't have time in this video. I did that in other videos. If the leaders in Israel had received Christ, he would have honored them as his messengers to carry the gospel to the world. To them first was given the opportunity to become heralds of the kingdom and grace of God. But Israel knew not the time of her visitation. The jealousy and distrust of the Jewish leaders had ripened into open hatred and the hearts of the people were turned away. Now I want you to get what's being said here. The leaders, the jealousy and distrust of the Jewish leaders had ripened into open hatred and the hearts of the people were turned away from Jesus. So the people were turned away from the teachings and the truths of Jesus by the Jewish leaders. That's very key. Let's continue. The Sanhedrin had rejected Christ's message and was bent upon his death. Therefore, Jesus departed from Jerusalem, from the priests, the temple, the religious leaders, the people who had been instructed in the law, and turned to another class to proclaim his message and to gather out those who should carry the gospel to all nations. Now, saints, remember, the whole key here is to carry this message to the entire world. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the world for a witness, and then shall the end come, brothers and sisters. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth, and to every nation, kin, and tongue, and people, saying, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Brothers and sisters, you and I are modern spiritual Israel and God has given us a message. He has given the same manner has been laid upon us that was laid upon ancient Israel. And Satan is doing the same thing to us that he did to ancient Israel to prevent us from carrying this message to the whole entire world. Now, back then, brothers and sisters, God had to turn from the Jewish leaders to others to gather them out to use them to carry this message. Now, let's follow this thing because, see, brothers and sisters, here's where we're going to learn the truth, the parallels, how they, how they line up. Let's continue now. So he had, and together, he had to turn to another class to proclaim his message and to gather out those who should carry the gospel to all nations. Let's continue, saints. The leaders. So the first three and a half years of Jesus' ministry was directed to the leadership of the Jewish nation. Now remember, that was seven years in his ministry. Desolate house. I think we need to go to our Bible before we go to the screen. Let's go to our Bible. Let's go to Matthew, the 24th chapter. 23rd chapter, rather. Matthew, the 23rd chapter. You have read this many times, saints, and you probably have never made application to it. What it's really saying. Let's go to Matthew, the 23rd chapter. Let's look at verses 37, 38, and 39. And remember, saints, our goal now is to go to 1995. O Jerusalem, the Bible says, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Jesus now has been ministering for three and a half years to the leadership. The leadership had rejected him. From, from Matthew 21, 22, 23, 24, uh, 23, Jesus is now dealing with the leaders. The last, last effort, and they have rejected him. In Matthew 23, he pulls off the glove and began to tell them about him, themselves. Verse 38, he says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. What is Jesus talking about? It's only 31 AD. It's not 34 AD. What is he saying? Your house is left unto you desolate. Let's go back one slide and see. The Sanhedrin had rejected Christ's message and was bent upon his death. Therefore, Jesus departed from Jerusalem, from the priests, 
the temple and the religious leaders. Your house is left unto you desolate, the prophet says. When Christ near the close of his earthly ministry looked for the last time upon the interior of the temple, he said, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Hitherto he had called the temple his father's house. But as the Son of God passed out from those walls, God's presence, listen saints, it's decision time, God's presence was withdrawn from ever from the temple built to his glory. Now what's going on here? It's not 34 AD. The Jews have until 34 AD before the probation closed. So what's happening in 31 AD? Why is Jesus saying your house is left until you desolate in 31 AD? Why does the prophet say that he has departed from Jerusalem, from the priests, etc., etc.? And remember when Jesus made this startling denunciation that the disciples came to him, wait, wait a minute, Jesus, what, what do you mean here? And Jesus said, that will, look, don't you see all these beautiful stones? Don't you see this Ephesus? And Jesus says, there will not be one stone left upon another. And the, the, the disciples even have to have, after having been with Jesus for three and a half years, still didn't understand what his mission was, still didn't understand. And so they said, well, they, they reasoned in their mind, if there's ever going to come a time when this beautiful temple is going to be destroyed, then it must be the end of the world. And that's the reason in Matthew, the 24th chapter, they said, well, tell us, when shall these things be? What should be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And then Jesus began to tell them these things. But we, that's not our purpose here today, to go into that. He, in 31 AD, Jesus makes this startling announcement, your house is left unto you desolate. What did he mean by that? Let me tell you what he meant. And then I'm going to back it up. What Jesus meant by that is that he could no longer work through the corrupt leadership of the Jewish nation any longer in an attempt to reach the people that were under their guidance. In other words, saints, leadership had gone so far into apostasy that God says, I have worked with you for three and a half years. You have rejected everything that I've done. I can no longer work through you to reach my people that are still in this nation that need to be reached with the truth. I can't work with you no more. Your house is left unto you desolate. Are you understanding that, saints? It's decision time. He turned to another class that he could use to finish the work. Now, you watch this thing. Watch it. Let's continue. 327 A.D., 31 A.D., 34 A.D. Now, just so that we fully understand something here. In the Jewish economy, there is a sanctuary. Three times a year, all the male Jews had to come into Jerusalem. But let's go through this just for a minute. Because, see, the sanctuary is the key. It is the key to a complete system of truth. One year in the sanctuary service represents the whole plan of salvation. Out at the, the, the altar, we have the Passover. We have unleavened bread. And you can see at the top... The, the dates for each one of these events. We got the first fruits at the labor. 16th day of the first month. Then we end, when you get into the holy place, you got Pentecost. 50, 50 days after the first fruits. Then you got the blowing of the trumpets, announcing that the day of atonement is coming. That's the fifth, first day of the seventh month. Then you have the day of atonement is in the most holy place. That's where we came on the scene. That's the tenth day of the seventh month. Now you... Line these up. That's six of them going across there. Now we have number seven. Number seven is the tabernacle. It's the 15th to the 21st of the seventh month. Now the reason I didn't put it down at the bottom because the tabernacle will be celebrated in heaven in this anti-typical application. Now all of these others have all we are not, all we have, all of these others have been full anti-typical. We are now in the anti-typical day of atonement, which is number six. Number seven will actually be celebrated in heaven. But here's the key. I look at the top. Three times a year, all the Jews, all the male Jews had to come into Jerusalem. They had to come in on the uh, unleavened bread, which was the 15th to the 21st of the, uh, the first month. They had to come in at Pentecost. And they had to come in at Tabernacles. Now watch what we are about to discover, saints. Jesus has announced that your house is left unto you desolate. If you go to Matthew, the 26th chapter, let's go there right quick. After he's 
after he, he starts this discourse in Matthew the 21st chapter, he goes to Matthew 21, Matthew 22, Matthew 23, Matthew 24, Matthew 25, Matthew 26, and let's see what he says in Matthew 26, 1 and 2. And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these things, he said unto his disciples, all these things is Matthew 21, Matthew 22, Matthew 23, Matthew 24, Matthew 25. When he had finished all these things, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Jesus understood on Wednesday, the second, that Wednesday he was going to be crucified two days later. He understood this. So on Wednesday, he said, in two days, I will be crucified because he knew that his ministry was going to last for three and a half years. And he knew that he would be crucified at the Passover because he was the anti-typical Passover. He was the anti-typical Passover. And so he knew it was time for him to be crucified. And so he knew that he could no longer work through the Jewish leaders because he's getting ready to leave. He tried to work through them. So he's getting ready to leave. So now he's going to pass the mountains to someone else that would hear him and follow his instruction and do the work that needs to be done at that time. Are you with me, saints? Now, so three times a year, all the male Jews had to come into Jerusalem. So that means at Passover, at the days of unleavened bread, because the days of unleavened bread, remember, is on the 14th day, on the 14th day. I mean, on the, th uh, the, the days of unleavened bread starts on the 15th day and goes all the way down to the 21st day. Passover was on the 14th day. Days of unleavened bread starts on the 15th to the 21st. And then uh, we got the, the offering of the first fruits on the 16th day of the first month. So that means when Jesus was crucified, all of the male Jews from everywhere was in Jerusalem. Now get this, brothers and sisters. These same people were back at Pentecost, which was 50 days later. So the people, all the people, all the males was in town on the pass, at the Passover, because Passover takes place on the 14th. Now let's look at this next slide. Pilate then took his place on the judgment seat and again presented Jesus to the people, saying, Behold your king. Again, the mad cry was heard. A wave of him. Crucify him. In a voice that was heard far and near, Pilate asked, Shall I crucify your king? But from profane, blasphemous lips went forth the words, We have no king but Caesar. Thus, by choosing a heathen ruler, the Jewish nation had withdrawn from the theocracy. Let's go now to Matthew, the 27th chapter. Let's look at verses 19 and 20. Verse 19 says, When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude. Who is this multitude? This multitude are all of the people that have come into Jerusalem for the, to be there at the days of unleavened bread. They have come in three or four days ahead. And so they're there at Passover. So this is the multitude. It is just not the local Jews. It is the Jews from all over the world. So let's read again verse 20. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Going back to our screen, going to the bottom now. They had rejected God as their king. Henceforth, they had no deliverer. They had no king but Caesar. To this, the priests and teachers had led the people. For this, with the fifth results that followed, they were responsible a nation's sin and a nation's ruin were due to the religious leaders. Now I want to ask you a question, saints, you who are now viewing this, 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 this DVD. What would you have done had you been in that crowd that night when the leaders told the people to ask for Barabbas and crucify Jesus? The question is, would you have known enough about the message to reject they're, 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 they're telling you to ask for Barabbas and crucify Jesus. Would you, have, would you have had the nerve to stand up in that crowd and say, no, give me Jesus? Because, brothers and sisters, you have to make that decision now. 
Because when you understand what the three angels' message is saying, you're going to have to make a decision to accept Jesus and crucify Barabbas. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Because, saints, again, we are being told to ask and accept Barabbas and crucify Jesus, and we are, you're going to see that it's coming out almost, it is, almost every day. We're being told the same thing. Do this, do that, do this. And the word of God and the spirit of prophecy says the exact opposite. When, when the leadership told you to put on a wedding band and jury, does the Bible say that? Does the spirit of prophecy say that? The spirit of prophecy says not one penny should be spent for a circle of gold to testify that we are married. So when you put that wedding band on, you just accepted the Barabbas and crucified Jesus. Do you understand? What I'm, and it gets deeper, much, much, much deeper than that, brothers and sisters. Much, much deeper. When you believe, when you are told that you cannot overcome sin and God says you can, you are accepting Barabbas and crucifying Jesus. Let's continue, brothers and sisters. Give us Barabbas. They were persuaded to do that. Now watch it. The people of Israel had made their choice, pointing to Jesus. They had said, not this man, but Barabbas. Barabbas, the robber and murderer, was the representative of Satan. Christ was the representative of God. Christ had been rejected. Barabbas had been chosen. Brothers and sisters, when we go and read Purpose Driven Life, when we'll go off to these, these Willow Creek and all these places to learn how to have mega churches, we are accepting Barabbas and crucifying Jesus. Listen to this thing, saints. Christ was the representative of God. Christ had been rejected. Barabbas had been chosen. Barabbas they were to have. In making this choice, they accepted him who were the, from the beginning was a liar and a murderer. Satan was their leader. As a nation, they would act out his dictations. His works they would do. His rule they must endure. That people who chose Barabbas in the place of Christ were to feel the cruelty of Barabbas as long as time should last. Brothers and sisters, it's decision time. Let's continue, saints. The religious leaders, the guides and instructors of the people, the men who ought to have pointed the people to Jesus, saying, as did John, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, follow the lead of the enemy of all good. They persuaded the poor, ignorant people who knew not the scriptures. Brothers and sisters, do you know the scriptures today? Do you understand the pillars of our faith? Are you being led astray simply because you are not studying and understanding the word of God? Simply because you are listening to what somebody tell you rather than what the word of God says? Saints, it's decision time. And it's time to take a stand for God. It is better to obey God than to obey man. They persuaded the poor, ignorant people who knew not the scriptures which testify of Christ to reject the Son of God and led them to choose a robber and murder. You say, well, if I'd have been there, I would have done different. Well, brothers and sisters, you're here. And the time now is worse than then. We're, we're doing the same thing today, even worse, because we have the example and we're still doing it. Listen to this thing, say. The chief priests and elders persuaded the people that they should ask for robbers and destroy Jesus. Why did they do this? Because of envy and jealousy. Prejudice, she says, is blind, unreasonable, vindictive, and cruel. Under its maddening power, people are rendered insane. Wrath is cruel, and anger is outrageous. But who is able to stand before envy? Continue to say. Now listen to this statement. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 37, 38, your house is left unto you desolate. This is in 31 AD, not 34 AD. And remember, the Jews' probation didn't close them to, to 34 AD. But Jesus in 31 AD says, your house is left unto you desolate. I can, he said, I can no longer work through the leadership to reach my people that's still in here. The leaders in the Jewish nation had signally fail of fulfilling God's purpose for his chosen people. Those whom the Lord had made the depositors of truth had proved unfaithful to their trust and God chose others to do his work. In their blindness, these leaders now gave full sway to what they call righteous indignation against the ones who were setting aside their church doctrine. Saints, did you get that? God chose others to do the work that leadership had failed to do. Go and read Testimonies, Volume 5, page 80, 81, 82, and 83 and see who's God's choosing. 
See what God says in this found work, who he, who he will have to use. Brothers and sisters, it's decision time. Can God use you? Or will you choose Barabbas? Look at this thing, see? You see now here that I put in 1995 until the National Son of Law is a time period between 31 AD and 34 AD. What am I saying? I'm saying that the same thing that Jesus did in 31 AD in rejecting the leadership and turning to others to do the work he has done also with us. I am saying that as of 1995, Jesus has chosen others to do the work. Now, does that mean that we need to leave the church? No, 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 no. There's a work to be done in the church, but the work to be done now has to be done by others that will stand up and proclaim the three angels' message that will call sin by his right name, that will expose the man of sin who have made the son of the law a, 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 a test, that will not give him a gold melt. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. So brothers and sisters, we are living now between 1995 and the NSL. God has now chosen others. He wants to use you. Let's, let's continue. They would not admit even the possibility that they themselves did not rightly understand the word or that they had misinterpreted or misimplied the scriptures. They acted like men who had lost their reason. What right have these teachers, they said, some of them mere fishermen to present ideas contrary to the doctrine that we have taught to people. Saints, you need to go read Acts chapter 1 all the way down to chapter 7. You need to read the whole book of Acts. But chapter 1 through 7 will bring all of this out. Then read Acts of the Apostles, the first part that deals with this. And then read the Desire of Ages, the part that deals with this. Get this for yourself. Don't go tell anybody that Moses Mason said anything. You go and read the word and the spirit of prophecy of the Bible for yourself. Are you with me, saints? What right have these teachers, they said, some of them mere fishermen to present ideas contrary to the doctrines that we have taught the people? Being determined to suppress the teaching of these ideas, they imprisoned those who were presenting them. Did you get that, saints? At Jerusalem, the work of the disciples must begin. In other words, the others that God chose to do the work that leadership had failed to do was the disciples. That word disciples means discipline. Discipline, brothers and sisters. The first office of mercy must be made to the murderers of the Savior. So the work that the, the apostles had to do must begin at Jerusalem. The work that has to be done now must begin in the church. Because God is not now working to bring many into the church because those who are in the church who were once converted are no longer converted and many have never been converted. Testimonies, volume 6, I believe, page 372. There are people being brought in, saints, but they are being brought in not according to the word of God. They don't know this message. We're down to three baptismal vows. Saints, it's decision time. We're not saying this untactful or distasteful, but we're simply telling you, saints, we're at the end of time, and it's time for you to get into the word of God for yourself. The first office of mercy must be made to the murderers of the Savior. And there were in Jerusalem many who had secretly believed on Jesus and many who had been deceived by the priests and rulers. To these also the gospel was to be presented. They were to be called to repentance. The wonderful truth that through Christ alone could remission of sins be obtained was to be made plain. That's the work to be done right now. God is choosing others. Do you want to be a part of the team that God will use to finish this work, saints? Look what the prophet says. As Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, you know the story on the day of Pentecost, as Peter is preaching now, and he goes through and he begins to show. Now remember, on the day of Pentecost, those people that were there at, at, at the Passover who were persuaded to ask for Barabbas are back 50 days later. And when you read, when you open up the book of Acts and begin to read and you get the first two, it says there were those, the devout men was there from every nation under heaven. They were, the Bible calls them devout men because they they are doing what God told them to do. God told them to come into Jerusalem three times a year, and they're there. So they are back 50 days later. It's the same group that 50 days before had been persuaded to ask for Barabbas and crucify Jesus. But now, Peter and the apostles have been there in the upper room. They are now imbued with the Holy Spirit. And they began to preach with power. And as they began to preach with power, you go from Acts chapter 1, chapter 2, and you get out. Let's go, let's, go, let's, let's go to the book itself. Let's go to the Bible, brothers and sisters. Let's go to the Bible. Acts, the third chapter, second chapter, rather. Let's read it. 
Acts chapter 2, starting with verses. Peter's now coming to the end of his, 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 his sermon, 22 verses. He says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both the Lord and Christ. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, and the, the ones that heard this is this multitude, the same multitude that was there 50 days earlier. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The prophet comments, he says, Now they heard the disciples declaring that it was the Son of God who had been crucified. Priests and rulers tremble. Conviction and anguish seized the people. They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Among those who listened to the disciples were devout Jews who were sincere in their belief. Many of you that are looking at this DVD are sincere in your belief, but you're being led to crucify Jesus and, 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 and ask for Barabbas. It's decision time. It's time for you to head back, brothers and sisters, to the foundation pillars that God gave us. Among those who listened to the disciples were devout men who were sincere in their belief. The power that accompanied the words of the speaker convinced them that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Peter, listen to this, listen to this thing. Peter urged home upon the convicted people the fact that they had rejected Christ because they had been deceived by priests and rulers and that if they continued to look to these men for counsel, saints, are you hearing what you're reading? Are you understanding this? And if, the, if they continued to look to these men for counsel and waited for them to acknowledge Christ, before they dared to do so, they would never accept him. Brothers and sisters, if you're waiting to be told by leadership today, and I hate to say it this way, and I don't mean to say that all the leaders are bad, but I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, the chief leaders, just the chief priests of today, is just like the chief priests of yesterday. If you're waiting to get a mandate from, from, from headquarters to tell you to get out of the city and get into the country, brothers and sisters, you're never going to hear that. But the Bible, the Spirit of Prophecy says you need to get out of the city and get into the country where you can grow your own food. Brothers and sisters, if you're waiting for all these precious truths that God has given us, to, to, for you to hear it from, sad to say, a corrupt priesthood, you're not going to hear it. You're going to have to take a stand on the truth for yourself and move out in faith and obey God. Listen to this thing, saints. And if they continue to look to these men for counsel and waited for them to acknowledge Christ before they dared to do so, they would never accept him. These powerful men, though making a profession of godliness, were ambitious for earthly riches and glory. They were not willing to come to Christ to receive light. When you go and look at the history of why these men rejected Christ, it was because of a false educational system. Saints, that's exactly the reason we are doing, we are asking for Barabbas today and crucifying Jesus because of a false educational system that came out of the French Revolution. More about that later. So, saints, in closing this segment, 27 A.D., 31 A.D., and 34 A.D. become major dates for us. Where are we today in relationship to what happened back then? Saints, we are between 31 and 34 A.D., and we are very, very close to 34 A.D. because we are very, very close to the passing of the National Senate Law. And now God is choosing others to do the work that leadership have failed to do. Is this still God's church? Yes. Still have people in this church. There's still people in here that need to be reached. We don't need to go off to farm some little company and say we're the church now. No, 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 no. God is going to get a people out of this church. The wheat and the tares will be separated. The work now is for you and I to be about our father's business, to reach these people within the inside. Now, does that mean you got to go in the inside and preach? No, 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 no. Don't mean that. I mean, you need to pray. You need to ask God. Ellen G. White tells us in, in Testimonies and Messages, page 411, that Satan has built up walls around God's church to prevent the truth from getting to them. But she says God has men of opportunity who will go through those walls as if they are walls tempered with untempered mortar. 
That's the reason, brothers and sisters, you have received this first DVD. That's the reason you have received this little booklet. Because we are going through those walls as if they are walls with untempered mortar. We are devising means under the, by the grace and power of God to reach God's people with the truth before it's everlasting too late. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Where are we? We are very close to 34 AD. Saints, even as I speak right now, we are in a monetary crisis. This monetary crisis is prophecy in the fulfillment. Fullness of the time, 27 A.D., 31 A.D., 34 A.D. 34 A.D. lines up with the National Sunday Law. 31 A.D. lines up with 1995. And 27 A.D., saints, lines up with 1888. More about that later. We are now operating between 1995 and the National Sunday Law. The King of the North has entered the glorious land. Now, we will show you now how. The king of the north has entered the glorious land. And why now? You can see now why it's necessary for you and I to be about our father's business. Are you with me, saints? Brothers and sisters, I just want to encourage you. Go and study this information for yourself. You, the quotes are there. The, the, the Bible text is there. Pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead you, guide you, and direct you. And again, I want to say, we are not here suggesting in any way, shape, or form shape, form, or fashion, that we should leave the church. Though there might be some places where you can't really attend, but we're not asking you to, to go and, and leave the church. We're asking you, by the grace of God, pray, have an upper room experience, ask God for wisdom. First of all, get your own life in armament. Go return. Look, brothers and sisters, Jude said we must earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Perhaps you might be one of those saints that have been baptized into this church and not been told these precious truths then you need to get into the word of God. You need to give to somebody that you have up until this point thought were peculiar. And matter of fact, they probably were peculiar because they were doing what God told them to do. And you need to find out what it is that God has called us into existence to be. We are a peculiar people. God has chosen us to be his ambassadors. Brothers and sisters, we must take a stand for the precious truth that God has given us. Now, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to have prayer. And we're going to have to add another DVD into this series because the next session that goes with this glorious land, the one that we're dealing with now, the glorious land, cannot be cut short. We must have time to finish it and finish it properly. So let's have a word of prayer. And uh, we're going to move into the, uh, we'll call it, I guess, DVD 6A or 6-2 or what have you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your precious truths. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for us. Lord, please bless those that are viewing this information. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will teach them and show them what it is that you would have them to do. And they will take up the mantle, draw near unto thee. Lord, develop that vital connection that is so necessary at this time, that we might live a victorious life in Christ. Become a part of that team you will use once you separate the wheat from the tares at the passing of the National Center Law to do this work that has to be done now. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen.